Arthur Brooks, welcome to the show. Thank you, Tom. What a jo joy to be with you. Dude. Long time viewer, first time guest. I seriously doubt this will be the last time. Your book, Strength to Strength, blew me away. Thank it you. was one of those where I actually got emotional reading the book because as I was telling you before we started rolling, I have spent a long time haunted by the idea that genius is a young man's game. Mm. And that ties into my first question, which is why do so many people feel lost and unhappy and what can they do about it? Mm. People feel lost and unhappy is basically part of what it means to be human. And there's, a, there's an irony in the, having the big brains that we do. We developed a, a very large human brain over the past 40 million years for all kinds of reasons. I mean, it's the, it's, it gives us a, it's our genetic advantage that we could say it gives us help. It's our survival. We're not fast. You know, we're not very good climbers. You know, we don't have a lot of hair on our bodies, but we got big, these got these big prefrontal cortex of the brain. The problem with that is that we can understand ourselves. We're the only species, as far as we know, that knows that, you know, Tom knows he's going to die. Mm. For example, you can understand the nature of your own existence, but you, you can't actually make your own existence work in a fundamentally different way. And so knowing yourself, the, the essence of consciousness is one that, that gives you incredible transcendental information, but at the same time, it programs in a whole lot of misery. So for, for example, you know, we have a tendency to, to our, our genetic proclivities force us to chase money and power and admiration and pleasure because those are the things that help you pass on your genes. You get more animal skins and, and flints and buffalo jerky in your cave and you're going to have more mates basically. Yep. And so mother nature wants you to do that, mm. but it's not going to make you happy. And you think that you want to be happy. The big prefrontal cortex says, I want to be happy because you're so conscious but the things that will help you pass on your genes are not the things that are going to make you happy. Mother Nature doesn't care if you're happy. And that's why it's so much more work. If, it, if you live by, if it feels good, do it. You're going to be a, you're going to be a mess. That's so it comes weird. Down to. Yeah. That's so true. Mm. So I had a realization a long time ago. I'm very grateful that this happened early. It was, of course, born of misery. But I became so profoundly unhappy chasing money. I used to show up every mm. day saying, I am here to get rich. And that provided me a lot of energy. So as a child of the 80s, growing up in Tacoma, mm. so and I really grew up on the edge of Tacoma. It's probably more accurate, even though my address really was Tacoma, it's more accurate to say I grew up in Puyallup. Yeah, Puyallup, so, where the fair was. Oh, yes. Or the Western Washington State Fair, now the Washington State that, Fair. That is yeah. all accurate. And I, it felt almost rural. Mm -hmm. And so I felt like I was living in the middle of nowhere. And John Hughes Films showed me sort of this upper middle class Chicago suburb and I was obsessed with right. getting a big house. And so I used to tell everybody, I'm gonna get rich, I'm gonna get rich. And my family was like, and I had friends that like, and I could literally walk to a trailer park. It was like that mm -hmm. kind of part of Tacoma. And so my family who were all sort of blue collar just thought that was hilarious. And they're like, yeah, right. And, but that I was really obsessed. And yeah. so I, um, were you a good student? Were you smart? I was, but I was cheating. So I was uh, really, I did very well in high school from cheating. And then in college, literally from cheating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like I was charming. Yeah. So I could get away with murder. So Whether you're that incredibly was, clever. Ooh, that's interesting. My identity is not that of someone who is clever. So, it was very much somebody who was charming. So I could uh, make people laugh. Yeah. And so I could get away with things. So whether that was asking my friends to let me literally take the test off of their desk and put it on mine so I could show my work. Right. But of course I was showing their work. <laughs> uh, but when I got to college, and I'm not even sure what gave me this insight, but I was like, I'm going to be spending a lot of money taking on a lot of debt. I should actually learn what I'm here to learn. Hmm. So I set a mantra to myself, sink or swim, A or F, I won't cheat, not even once. And so, and I ended up doing very well. In fact, I did better in college than I did in high school. Were you happy in college? I was, I was. It, when I graduated though, I was like, I'll never go back. Uh -huh. I'm not one of those people that was like, oh, I'm gonna get a master's and then a PhD. I was like, get me the fuck out of here. Huh. But it was, it was film, so it was amazing. Yeah, and you were living by the dictates of your own integrity. You were a man fully alive. Yes. You were not shading the truth. Very true. He's very important. And this is what's, you know, this is, there's, there's a famous speech by, you know, and an, an, I can't remember who it was, the guy who went on to become the president of the University of Texas, who gave, who became famous because he gave a, an, uh, 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 
a commencement speech that was about make your bed. If you want to actually get your life on track, start by making your bed. What that was was uh, to ask people to become men and women of integrity. And that means even when nobody's looking at your bed, make your bed because you're a person of integrity. You went to college and you said to yourself, I'm going to be a person of integrity. I am not going to do that thing because mm -hmm. that thing is not the right thing. And in so doing, you ordered your mind in a different way. It's really interesting. So... I wish that my life was like a straight trajectory after that, but it becomes the darkest period of my life becomes right after college mm. when I feel lost, I feel hopeless. I have no sense of how I'm going to put things together. That was a really scary time because when you don't feel that you can affect the change that you want, it really, for me, any, well, let's go back to what you said at the beginning. So I call that the directives of evolution. So, mm. If you think of AI, AI has to be given instructions. You right. have to want a high score or you right. have to want to stay within the lanes of your car, or whatever. And humans as nature's AI need directives. And so like right. you said, get a mate, that's definitely one of them. And man, I really hope at some point later in the conversation after we've really gone into your book, we get to the fact that people are 30% less likely to get laid now, which is absolutely fucking terrifying to me. Mm -hmm. um, but I have the solution for greater happiness on college campuses. Really? <laughs> it's more love. Yeah? Now, yeah. what do you mean by that, though? Well, I mean, actually, more relationships, more romantic relationships. This would actually solve a lot of the misery on college campuses today, actually. is I mean, what were you trying to do in college? You probably wanted to fall in love, right? No. Oh, uh, no. So I, I didn't. So I had a girlfriend at uh -huh. the very beginning of college, like the first few weeks, uh. who I'd met in high school. Right. And... I broke up with her and re decided that to get into film school, I had to really buckle down and I wasn't going to date. I wasn't going to party. I wasn't going to drink. I wasn't right. going to do drugs. And so I effectively locked myself in a room for four years mm. to get good at filmmaking. Mm. So it was a very a different, different kind of experience yeah. than a lot of people. But now I want to, I want to get people back to your book because it is absolutely life changing. So I would show up every day trying to get rich. That right. was my whole shtick. As an entrepreneur. Yep. And then because I wanted to build a studio. Right. Became profoundly unhappy pursuing that. And the lesson that I ultimately ended up learning was that all that matters in life is how you feel about yourself when you're by yourself. Mm. And so meaning and purpose matter. Right. And so I had better figure out that money wasn't going to bring me happiness. I was living the cliche. And so I needed to attach meaning and purpose to what I How was How did doing. you figure that out, that money was not going to bring you happiness? So, so on paper, right. I was worth more money than I'd ever been worth. So I was making more than I'd ever made. I was making right. like maybe 80, 85,000, something like that, which uh -huh. for me, that was Good at money. the time, that was a yeah. lot of money. And on paper, I was worth about $2 million. Uh -huh. So I was like, okay, theoretically, and paper money is very different than real money, but yeah. on paper, I was worth millions of dollars uh -huh. and I was still profoundly unhappy. So and I was did like, you well, think, what did you think? If I'm getting, it's like when I see your, your limbic system of your brain is saying, Tom, go for the money, then you'll be happy. So what did you imagine was going to happen to you if you had a whole bunch of money that would actually make you happy? Or did you actually form uh, an image at all? You just thought that if I have more money, I'm going to mysteriously be happy? Yes. Then once I wasn't, I asked myself maybe the right question, which but is why? what did, yeah, what did I think was going to happen? And I realized that I thought I would feel about myself the way that I felt about other people when that had money when I looked at them ah, yes. and I admired them. Okay. So Comes I thought I would social admire comparison. myself. Got it. And you would actually, so social comparison led you to the admiration of other people who had been successful. So therefore you would have that a sort of an admiration of yourself. Yes. And that self admiration would have been the, the genesis of your, of your newfound happiness on the yes. basis of your money. And if I were as able to articulate that to myself as you were just now, I I'm could have saved myself a lot of struggle. <laughs> but um, I couldn't either at 22. But yeah, yeah, it was disastrous. Yes. All right, my friend, I have a big announcement. My incredible and talented wife, Lisa, is about to launch her new book, Radical Confidence. In it, she has managed to perfectly capture the process of how to go from feeling lost and insecure to taking control of your life and doing amazing things despite feeling fear, sometimes a lot of fear. Now, let me tell you, nobody knows Lisa better than me, but when I read Radical Confidence for the first time and heard her describe what it was like for her to go from having these big, exciting dreams as a kid to then as an adult, 
scheduling her life around the TV shows that she wanted to watch or how lonely and isolated she felt instead of pursuing her dreams, it was brutal for me. I would never say though that it was worth it for her to go through all of that just so that she could write something down that allows others to avoid it, but I will say that at least she was able to capture the strategies that she used to break out of that rut, find her voice, and begin doing incredible things despite her insecurities and fears that she wasn't going to be good enough to achieve great things. Order your copy today because if you act now, you can claim the bonuses that Lisa has created for you at RadicalConfidence.com. Then, once you've done that, we'll get back to today's episode. All right, guys, read the book and get ready to be the hero of your own life. Peace out. So, but thankfully I figured that out. And so reading your book really began to bring home this idea that there are two different types of intelligence. And so at the time I'm haunted by this idea, genius is a young man's game. I feel like a really late bloomer. I end up spending all this time chasing money, not I take this huge break from pursuing my passion and building that skill set. So now I really feel like I'm behind the eight ball. And my whole life has felt like that. And reading your book and the whole punchline of there's these two grand movements in your life. And if you understand them, then you really can avoid this decline in misery. Right. You open your book with a story that I will never forget. And when I put the book down, I was like running around the office, like telling anybody who would listen to that story. If you don't mind, yeah. walk people through the airplane. 10 years ago, I was the president of a think tank in Washington, DC. And I was having these profoundly disturbing thoughts. Am I on the right track? Where does this lead? What is my goal? But you're really successful at this point. Yeah. I mean, successful for, you know, for entrepreneurs in Southern California, you know, what does successful mean? To be the president of a think tank in Washington, D.C., maybe not so much. But everybody's got a dream. It's a great country, isn't it? And I was the president of a, of a big, prominent think tank in Washington, D.C., and I was in my late 40s. So that was more or less the same age that you are right now. Mm. I was looking at my life saying, okay, buddy, what's the end game? And look, I had done research. I'm a social scientist. I do work on human behavior. And I had never really trained these tools on myself. And I, I was really disturbed by this because I didn't actually see what the future could actually bring that would be better or I would be happier. And as I was kind of going through this, I was doing what I always did, which is basically fly around and ask people for money. I was a nonprofit organization. I had to raise $50 million a year. And I was giving 175 speeches a year, which is super fun. I love Jesus. Yeah, yeah. And so it was like running for the Senate and never getting elected, basically, which is, you know, for running for the Senate, that's probably the best thing. So you don't have to be a senator. And as I was thinking about this, kind of an existential crisis, you know, what am I, what path am I on? What am I supposed to do? I mean, some of that was evident. I was, I have a family. I'm, I'm in love with my wife. I, I, I love my kids. But I didn't have an understanding of the, the course of my life. I mean, my religious life is figured out, but I don't understand what I'm supposed to be doing. Mm. What is Arthur Brooks supposed to be doing such that I can be happier as a person? And frankly, I wasn't very happy for lots of reasons that anybody can understand. I mean, and... And I heard a conversation behind me on a plane one night that changed my entire direction. It was a couple and I could, <clears throat> it was nighttime, it was like about 11 o'clock at night and I, so it was dark. And so people were doing what people do on airplanes at 11 o'clock at night, you know, they're drinking or they're, or they're watching a movie or they're sleeping, but I could hear the couple talking and I could tell it was a man and a woman. I could tell by their voices that they were elderly, clearly old. <clears throat> And I suppose that they were probably married based on their conversation. I couldn't quite make out the husband's words because he was sort of mumbling. Mm. But the wife's voice was very penetrating. It was coming through the chairs. And she's, he mumbles and he, she, she says, oh, don't say it would be better if you were dead. And then he mumbles some more. And she says, it's not true that nobody remembers you. It's not true that nobody appreciates you anymore. And I'm thinking this is a guy who, holy cow, he's not, he's not, he's not a big shot. He's not an entrepreneur. He's not, you know, he's not somebody who lived up to his own expectations. He got the, he got the experience or the education or the job that he wanted. And now life is kind of over and he's disappointed. And that makes sense or it made sense to me. Because, look, if you're a big shot, then you're going to die happy. Huh. And the lights go on at the end of the flight, an hour later or so. And I'm kind of curious. It's not prurient interest, but look, you know, this is my laboratory as a social scientist. Mm -hmm. It is an overheard conversation, perhaps. And, and so I turn around and it's one of the most famous men in the world. This is somebody who's going to do 10 times as much with his life as I ever am. He's rich. 
He's famous. He's universally admired. He's not controversial for stuff that he did many, many years ago. And I thought to myself, my whole model's wrong. The problem that I have, the direction that I'm going is incorrect because my model of, of, of satisfaction is wrong. Here's the model the world tells you. Here's the, the limbic system of your brain, the ancient part of your brain that was extant a million years ago, and all of marketing and entertainment, which is a, a, a distributed digital limbic system, says work hard, make money, be successful, be admired, be envied, bank it, die happy. And it's wrong. And, and you know, in your heart, it's wrong. Because you're always asking yourself, hey, Tom, what have you done for me lately? That's what your mind is asking you. Mm. It's not good enough that you founded a company a long time ago and it made a bunch of money. It's not good enough. We, we need to excel. We need to achieve. We need to create value. That's how we're created as people. And this guy was blowing away the, the world's theory of happiness, of satisfaction. And I said to myself, I don't want to be explaining to my wife, Esther, on a plane 30 years from now, 40 years from now, I might as well be dead. And so I set myself to crack the code. What can I do? And by the way, the data are very clear that the people who have the earliest success, the mind-blowing success, mm -hmm. they're the most likely to be unsatisfied with their lives at the end of their lives. The story that you tell about Darwin was unnerving. He could have been the man on the plane. Charles Darwin, who is on anybody's list of the three greatest scientists of all time, he was the talk of the town. His name rings through the annals of history, man. He's a hero. This is, I think I may have been even more struck by the Darwin confession yeah. than the guy Many, on the plane. many people who we revere today, who had early astonishing success, they died unhappy, but we don't record that. We record their success, mm -hmm. not the unhappiness with their life later on. Charles Darwin had his greatest successes starting when he was 27 years old. We all know that he visited the Galapagos Islands on the, on the voyage of the Beagle, which is a five-year sailing voyage around the world to collect plants and animals and send them back to England. He was getting quite famous in his absence, but when he got back, he drops this intellectual atomic bomb, which is the ideas that led to his theory of natural selection, AKA evolution. And for 30 years, I mean, he was, I mean, he was rich, he was famous, he was the man. But then his progress stopped. It stopped because he didn't have the mathematical ability to keep up with his own research. His research passed him by, technically. And there was, a, there was actually an advance that he needed that today we call genetics that he couldn't understand. It was written in German. He didn't study German. He was a bad student. He didn't do his mathematics homework. He never learned very much about statistics. And so the result was that he was left in the dust, which happens to people in their 40s and at most, most their early 50s based on their early success. Mm -hmm. And he spent the last 20 years of his life complaining about the disappointing, I mean, he wrote 11 books after that point, but they're all sort of derivative. They're like straw. And he said, that, oh, I don't have the energy to do any work that I really find satisfying to his friends. And you know, he died disappointed. He died sad. The great, maybe the greatest naturalist of all time died sad. He could have been the man on the plane. And this is not what the world tells you. The world says, bust your pick. Get as, as early as you can, get bet 10,000 hours, man. Kill it, kill it, bank it, you know? And if, if, if so, what? You know, the, the sine qua non of happiness excellence, retire at 40. Well, how many people do you know who've done that, who've actually gotten happier, mm. who retired at 40? I know none. The point is that's not how human endeavor actually works. And so we need a better model. And I saw that, I did the research and I said, Time to build a better model that actually describes the dynamics of human experience that actually digs into what actually brings us happiness. And that's what my research is about. That's what I'm dedicating the rest of my life to exploring. All right. So to put a fine point on it, the punchline ends up being there's two kinds of intelligence. Yes. So type one is fluid, sort of raw intelligence. It's Darwin's genius was fluid intelligence. It's innovative capacity. It's what made Tom Tom, which is your indefatigable energy, your focus, your ability to get better and better, to be the ninja in your particular field, which gets better and better through your 20s It and sounds 30s. sexy even as you're saying it. That, that's what I find so horrifying. Totally. That's hustle culture, man. Yeah. Hustle culture rewards that. And, and by the way... And it's, it's been an awesome ride. Oh, and I it's, but it's it. super addictive. Yeah. It's super addictive. It actually works in the same 
dopamine pathways is, you know, methamphetamines and alcohol. And yes, it is my one addiction. Success addiction. Yeah. It's 100%. a killer. And you, you know, write about it in the book about the success addiction that virtually all entrepreneurs, virtually all strivers have. You can be, you know, the ace electrician and have a success addiction because we are wired to want to be excellent and mm -hmm. to be admired, which leads you to get better and better and better at what you do using what we've identified as what psychologists have identified for a long time now as fluid intelligence. Your, the structure of your brain lends itself to just incredible energy and focus and to get better and better and better as an individual at solving any problem faster than others. The problem is, this is the problem that led to Darwin's misery and so many others. It peaks in your late 30s or early 40s and then it declines and then it declines faster. And if you try to keep your groove, you're going to ride that thing to the basement and you're going to be the man on the plane. You're going to be Darwin. You're going to be bitter and unhappy. And most people think they get one curve. That's the bad news. Mm. The good news is that's not your only curve. You have a second curve that comes in behind it, which is not your fluid intelligence, which goes up peaks comes down. It's your crystallized intelligence, your wisdom, which doesn't have fast working memory. The innovative capacity is not as good, but it's your ability to identify patterns, to use the information in your environment. It's like having the New York Public Library at your disposal. It takes a while to get the information. Like, I can't remember that thing because it's on the fourth floor back in the stacks. I got to send my guy to get it, but it's in there and you can use this information to be a teacher, to be a historian, to have actual wisdom. That's what you get better at through your 40s and 50s. And you can stay high in your 60s and 70s and beyond. That's your true success curve as you get older. The key is you got to walk from fluid intelligence over to crystallized intelligence. You got to walk from the star litigator to the managing partner, from the from the innovative startup entrepreneur to the venture capitalist, from the, from the mathematical researcher to the professor. Those are the different curves you gotta go from one to the other. And if you're stuck on the first, and if that's your vision of your own greatness, and you can't be thrown off that, you'll be chasing that for the rest of your life, even though it's just, it's in, it's in the basement, and you can't get it back. So there are some people that can wake themselves up out of the matrix, other people that must be awoken. Mm -hmm. I do fear sometimes that I need to be awoken, uh, but you woke yourself up. I'm so curious. So you're doing your thing. You're very successful. And I don't know, maybe, and I guess we should tell people that you started out as a musician, yeah. a French horn player, mm. nonetheless, very specific. Yes. And very esoteric and made a living as a professional yeah. French horn so the player Barcelona until Symphony 31, for a bunch of years. if I'm not mistaken. Yes, exactly right. All right. So you're killing that game, but you realize that you're declining. Do you think that going on that is what allowed you to then consciously step away while it seems like you were still in your prime as the leader, the president of this think tank? I got very lucky. I got very lucky that I failed my first career. And after having a lot of success, I went into early decline and out of desperation to support my family and to have a future out of my 20s, I had to change gears. Mm. I didn't have a college education. I dropped out of college, you know, dropped out, kicked out, splitting hairs. When I was 19, um, I, and I went on the road as a, as a musician. What, that's my parents call it, the gap, my gap decade, right? Which you can imagine how fun that was for them. <laughs> and, you know, I kind of made a living, kind of made my rent. You know, but I was I was living my best life because I was a young guy. I didn't have health insurance. I didn't go to the dentist for six years at one point, which I'm still paying for. And but like I've told friends, I um, I never missed a day without cigarettes. So you know, you you figure out what my priorities were at that particular point in my life. And fortunately, I gave that up a long time ago. But I was going into decline as a French horn player, and things that used to be easy became hard, and things that were hard became impossible. And I saw the writing on the wall. I saw a lot of older classical musicians who were deeply alcoholic and unhappy and had been good and now weren't and didn't have the respect of the younger people mm -hmm. that were having a harder time making a living. And I thought, look, I'm barely making a living now. I'm ambitious, and it's going well. I mean, look, I was in the Barcelona Symphony, so I was making a middle-class living, and that's a good orchestra. But I knew that I couldn't keep it up, and so I, I had to change. Just by necessity, I had to change. And I went back to college, got my college degree by correspondence, um, and at 31 left to start my PhD. That, by the way, that's not just an arbitrary thing. It's the family business. My father was a college professor. My grandfather was a college professor. So I knew that business more better than any other. I know how to do a PhD. My father was working on his PhD even when I was a kid. So I saw that whole process. That wasn't foreign or exotic to me at all. And I knew what professors do for a living. 
And I said, okay, I can do that because I know that. I was, ve I was very ashamed. I was just, I felt horrible about myself that I had, that I, I had failed at this thing that it was everything to me. I mean, I, there were, I would have just as soon died than to not be a French horn player because there was nothing else. But I didn't die and I couldn't die because I was a married man that was in love with my wife and, and you know, we were going to have kids and what, what was I going to do? I mean, you'd, were you you'd honest do, with her about what you're going through at that point? Yeah, yeah, she knew well. She knew full well. I mean, she knows me. I'm an open world. I'm an open book with her. And uh, I mean, she's also smart. And, you know, we she she knows me super well in no small part, because when we were dating, um, we didn't speak the same language. And we spoke rudimentary amounts of the same language for the entire first year of our marriage. Oh, you got to know each other. You get to know each other in a, in a deep human way when you actually can't talk because you can't lie. I recommend this to everybody. That's really unexpected. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. How and did you fall in love if you guys weren't speaking the man, same language? Man, if you language? saw her. <laughs> I was 24. She's a rock and roll singer from Barcelona. She's beautiful. And she's lovely. And she's kind. And she's smart. And weirdly, she liked me. And so... Um, and I threw in big time. I moved to Barcelona to try to convince her to marry me without speaking a word of the same language. This is what entrepreneurs do, right? This is the ultimate entrepreneurial experience is to give away your heart and, and to take a chance. That's what young people today, they're so non-entrepreneurial if they're unwilling to fall in love. Because that, I mean, forget the companies, forget the money, forget all the cool stuff that you and I have been able to do professionally. Fall in love, that's entrepreneurship. Right, that's the big bad. I've never heard anybody yeah. describe it like that. Well, entrepreneurship because of risk taking. Like, yeah, why do you? Entrepreneurship is taking a big risk in 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 looking for major rewards for explosive mm. returns. I'm not going to tell you how to denominate those returns. It's faith in resources that you don't already have in hand. These are the characteristics of the entrepreneur. When I was writing a textbook on entrepreneurship, I was looking at that. and I'm saying it's a it's a big mistake to talk about this in terms of money. We should be talking about this in terms of love because that's the currency of life. And when a whole generation of young people are miserable because they're comfortable putting millions of people, people's dollars at risk to start a company, but they're unwilling to go bankrupt in their relationships. They're unwilling to have somebody crush them by breaking up with them. They're just not very entrepreneurial. That's the problem. We have people who are too non-entrepreneurial, which is one of the reasons that we have too few people who are in love today, as far as I'm concerned. So that was the thing, man. I took that, I jumped, I did that, I did that. And that, that was actually very good because that gave me a lot of confidence that I could conquer my fear. I could take a risk. I mean, look, it was, it was a very low chance that this was going to work out and we're going to learn each other's language and she's going to realize I'm a hopeless stooge or something, or we're not going to love each other or something. And we just celebrated our 30th wedding anniversary. Congratulations. We have three adult children. <laughs> it's crazy. incredible. It's amazing. So, so that was, we know each other deeply, deeply, deeply. She knows all of my nonsense because she knows it without the words. You can shade all kinds of truth with, with words. You can't when it's just your heart. You're just a heart to heart. Now that's really unexpected. That's very intriguing to me. I would, because I have leaned on language so heavily in my life, in fact, if there's anything, so I once went live for 24 hours as a thing to like to celebrate hitting a certain number on Facebook. I don't even remember now what number, but went live for 24 hours. Oh, success. And then literally I, that morning or the next afternoon, whatever, I flew to London and then uh, I did an event with no microphone and I spoke for nine hours. So at the end of that, something happened to my my vocal cords and I was having a hard time talking and I could feel like my throat would click. Right. It was so distressing. Go to a, a therapist, they stick a camera down my throat, the whole nine, like trying to figure out what did I do? And I start really worrying, what does my life look like if I can't speak? Yeah. And that was the first time where I was like, whoa, like imagine losing that thing that made you you. Yeah. And I've always been highly verbal. That was always the thing that I could, Terrible at math, got horrendous SAT scores, but I'm highly verbal. You're extremely expressive. You're extremely expressive. I will give you that. I'll take that. It's absolutely true. 
So, yeah. and I thought, oh God, what happens if I lose my voice? So I can't imagine trying to court the woman who is now my wife of yeah. almost 20 years uh-huh. uh, without my voice. That's yeah. interesting. That yeah, no, no, and, and, and me too. Look, I mean, I talk for a living. I literally, I mean, blah, blah, blah. That's what I do for a living. Did it not hit you then that like, oh God, I'm taking away my superpower? Well, in those days, it wasn't my superpower. I was, a, I was a French horn player. Okay. So you guys and, connected over music. Yeah. Well, we were at a music festival in France, in Dijon, in France. That's how you met? Yeah. And I was on tour and she was studying. And she was studying with a, a teacher, an American teacher there. And we met at this music festival and, and, and we were playing music and that's what she did. And so that, that made it a little bit easier. I mean, right. we were less reliant on, on talking. Yeah. Then, then, then I am. Today. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And so that was, you know, it, it, when I went into the client as a musician, she was right there to be, be helpful. And she gave me, she gave me the courage. Yeah. Was she warm about it or was she super warm? She said I was deeply unhappy because I was in decline. Look, humans are not intended to decline. Decline is hugely painful because happiness comes from progress. Mm. Unhappiness well comes said. from regress. And when you feel that something is harder than it used to be, so it's interesting, you know, you see this, the decline in the fluid intelligence curve we just talked about. If you're really a striver, um, and that's who I'm working with. I'm working with people who want to make the most with their lives. And if you look, if you never do anything with your life, you're not going to know it's over. You're not going to have this big crisis at the end of your life. It's because you never did anything. And I was like, I watched a lot of TV. Awesome. It's like, I can still do that. Don't you think their whole life is a crisis? Not really. No, really? Actually, no, no, not really. Uh, we're no, 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 no. It's, yeah, no, for sure. I mean, well, here's the thing. It depends on what you mean by happiness and what a good life is. You know, I want my life as a striver, but I also recognize that it's not normal in many ways. To and strive? It not to strive to the extent that you have. Mm. But is that what you mean by it's not normal? Yeah. And it, it creates problems. I mean, you, you, you rain hell on yourself yep. when you're actually doing the stuff that you've done. And there's a lot of ways that you could have had a much easier life, a much more relaxing life, a oh, life with greater peace. Frequently. Yeah, for sure. So that's all I mean. It's, it's not a very profound point in that way. But when I, you know, when I was, when things were going poorly and I was deeply unhappy because I was in a state of regress, my wife said, you're unhappy you just need to quit. And I said, that's insane. I mean, like one can't just walk away, but of course. And she said, yes, you can. Absolutely. You can do anything you want. I said, we'll be poor. She said, we're already poor. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you know, how do you know? You know, it's, it's, you know, multiplying by zero is still zero. And, uh, and so we did, we just, we, we bailed, you know, we went to, we left Barcelona. We moved to Boca Raton, Florida, where nobody knew us. I took a pretty easy teaching job and I started studying by correspondence at night. Nobody knew I was doing it. She had a minimum wage job. She spoke very poor English, had not graduated from high school. Um, and so was learning English and making, you know, six bucks an hour or whatever it was. And I was getting paid to teach the French horn while secretly working on my bachelor's degree at night mm-hmm. to build my, to, to rebuild the person that I was. And then finished that and went on to and started my PhD, which is what I really thought I needed to do. And that took me a little, I came here to Los Angeles, as a matter of fact, and studied the Rand Graduate School in Santa Monica. And then I learned a new trade. I learned, I actually learned who I was as a person again for the first time, but it was like four years of, you know, it was weird. I couldn't, I remember trying to sign a check during that time and I couldn't replicate my own signature. And it turns out that that's actually quite frequent when people are in this period of liminality between phases of their life that their handwriting will change. What? Yeah. 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 It's actually a common occurrence. I didn't know. I'm like, I'm trying because to sign a check for the bank. And it's like, I'm sure, I'm sorry, Mr. Like, Brooks, this is not the right signature. Is yeah. it, is it because there's a subconscious part of you that's like, I'm not that person anymore? It's, I don't, it's, it's not well understood, but there's a, the, the neurophysiology of a lot of this stuff is we're just starting to understand. There's no doubt something that where these things are connected, where your sense of yourself is somehow connected to, to, to you know, these motor skills in a particular way. I couldn't replicate my own signature sufficiently. I got like rejected by the bank for cashing a check into my own account at one point. I'm like, my, my, my early dementia, I mean, what early stage something, what's going on here? And it, what it was, was I was in this profound state of liminality, which in retrospect was this f- just fertile period. You know, I tell the story in the book is a place that you and I both know as Pacific Northwest guys. Mm. There's a place called Lincoln city in Oregon. That's you're near just North of Newport. And I used to go there cause my aunt was uh, the receptionist, at the hotel and she had, a, she lived in a trailer 
near the beach. And it was like this bliss. I used to go there and I remember the first time I was trying to fish off the rocks in, in Lincoln City, Oregon. I was catching nothing. This old guy I lived in a shack is watching me and he comes up and says, kid, I've been, I've been watching you. You know, today he'd be arrested. But, <clears throat> and, and I said, he said, you're not catching anything, right? I said, no. He says, because you're doing it wrong. You can't catch any fish unless it's a falling tide. That's when the tide is going out very quickly, mm. rushing out between the rocks. And I'm like, well, all the fish are gone, right? He says, no, 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 you'll see. It's stirring up the plankton. The fish go crazy. It's happening in 45 minutes. He has his fishing pole. We throw our, we throw our lines in and we're pulling them out by, you know, by the tens. It's unbelievable. And, and afterward, he's feeling sort of philosophical. He lights up a cigarette on the rocks. I'm 11 or something. And he says, hey, kid, you know, during a falling tide, you can only make one mistake. I said, what's that? He said, not having your line in the water. And I have learned this, that the time between the tides of your life, the falling tide of your life looks like you're losing everything. Get your line in the water mm -hmm. because that's the most fertile period of your life. So what does it mean to have your line in the water? You must try new things. You must be fully alive. You must try everything you possibly can. You I'm must need you to define fully alive. To be to to wake up each day and to live that day full of possibility. Not to nurse your wounds, not to waste your time, not to try to do things that you used to do. To be fully alive is to be alive to the new set of experiences that's that's coming across the transom. That's super important because during this time of liminality, there's a, by the way, there's a lot of research on this. This is not just an anecdote about, you know, this kid fishing in Oregon. This is, there's a lot of research that shows that this time between periods in your life, which there's a guy named Bruce Feiler who's, who writes a book about transitions. And he said during these life quakes, you know, if, you're, if your spouse just left you, that's a fertile period for you to mm -hmm. learn new things. If you, you know, you've lost somebody to death, if you've, if you're, if you're going through chemotherapy, for example, this is, and you, and you're very you've afraid just been through a pandemic, for example, for example, if you, during the pandemic, many people find that despite the fact that they hated it and were insecure and it was horrible, that their lives transformed for the good. Mm -hmm. That in terms of what we're talking about here, the two curves, fluid and crystallized intelligence, that period between the two where you're you're declining in one and the other's increasing, but you don't know how to get on it or even what it means. That's your most fertile period. That's when things are, can be absolutely magic. They're not going to be fun. You might not be happy, but that's when magic can happen. So tell me about this then, because this happened to you. You've been in periods between that you got, you get out, you're successful, but you're miserable. And so you had to change. What was the time between the tides for you? What happened? You have a concept that resonates with me profoundly, which is that suffering is sacred. Mm. You have to do it well though. And I think there's a few key things that you have to recognize. And when you were telling your story about your wife, A, I don't even know who I would be without my wife. And as I think, so for a period, my wife and I now, I would say are in very a traditional gender roles, but in the beginning of our marriage, it was very traditional in a way that was profoundly um, transformative. So much of the way that she tried to express herself in the world was through me. Hmm. So she was a stay at home wife, but very shrewd, very sharp and would push me to be better and was beyond supportive when things were not going well for me and in a very similar vein of like I don't care if we're poor I want to see you happy that's all that matters to me and so when I was profoundly unhappy I would come home and I would say don't ask me about my day I don't want to think about it I have to separate myself from that and so finally it got to the point where she was like look this is starting to damage our marriage and so I'm going to need you to work less, to figure something out, whatever. And so that's when I went in and decided I was going to quit and we were going to move to a small town in Greece and I was wow. going to write again. She's Greek. And uh, it was I was going to do that, which made me feel alive. And so that was the refrain. I want to feel alive again. I want to feel alive again. And so I knew what that felt like because I had pursued my art so fervently for years and it made me feel some kind of way. And so I recognized the decline, was able to associate it with, well, you're just trying to get rich. You've made money. It hasn't changed. So there's something here that you've fundamentally misunderstood about the world. And my, I guess, liminal thing had been, it had been going on for a while because when I left film school, 
and did not understand how to break into the film industry, that was a devastating period. And I would just lay on the floor mm. and I couldn't afford to furnish my apartment. And I would, the, the plenty of room sort of, to lie yeah, down. like <laughs> hilarity was not lost on me. I could feel like that cheap nylon carpet that you get in cheap apartments and it would leave like an imprint on my face. Cause I would just lay on the floor and I'm like, this is so ridiculous. And I started reading about the brain and right. I don't remember where that insight came from. Maybe something I picked up in college. I don't know. But I was like, I need to learn about how the brain works. And so it's the late 90s and brain plasticity is being debated. And it wasn't, there wasn't an answer. Some people were like, yes, it's real. Other people were like, no, it's not. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to act as if it's true because that's so much mm -hmm. more hopeful. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't know the Einstein quote back then, but the quote of the most important decision anybody will make is whether they live in a friendly or a hostile universe. And me deciding mm -hmm. that I lived in a world where brain plasticity was real was me saying I live in a friendly universe. Right. And so I started trying to get better. And I was teaching at the time. And so I'm teaching film and I start noticing I can make the students' films better if I can make their films better. Because by this point, I believe I have no talent. That's a whole part of the story. So I believe I'm completely talentless. I thought I was born with talent. I clearly was not. I don't know how to break into the industry. I'm gonna teach because those that can do and those that can't teach. But I'm reading about the brain, brain plasticity. I'm helping the students make their films better. And I have a question in my mind, which is, well, if I can make their films better, why can't I make my own better? I was like, maybe I could. And so that gives me the hope that I need to be fully alive, to right. start approaching things with, hey, maybe I just need to get better and I can work on this. And I had read the Tao Te Ching when I was 16, hmm. which plants some very profound seeds in my mind, which I will now call a growth mindset. But back then, like, I didn't really understand how to put them to use in my life. But I start putting them to use in my life. I start getting better at filmmaking and you couple that with my wife being just incredibly encouraging, not afraid to be poor, wanting to see me happy. Um, and, and that was when I went in. And as I said before we started rolling, I went into my partners and I quit. And I said, look, I can't keep pursuing money anymore. And so I don't know, my version of having my, um, my line in the water was knowing I wanted to feel alive, believing that if I went and did the thing that I wanted to do, that I would get better at it. And that if I got good enough, I couldn't be denied. Right. And so the old, old Steve Martin quote, this would have been, would have been like 28, 29, 29. something So you're like really that. on your fluid intelligence curve in a big way. In but big not way. feeling it. So right. I have struggled my entire life. Have you seen Amadeus? Mm -hmm, for sure. Okay. So Solieri, mm -hmm. laments to God. Why did you make me? Oh my God, you're a musician. This will resonate mm -hmm. with you. Why did you make me just good enough to realize I'll never be as good as Mozart? Mm -hmm. Why couldn't you have made me like just a, another person in the crowd that can appreciate what right. he does. But you had to make me just good enough that I want to be that good yeah. and I realize I never will be. That's how I have felt my entire life. Mm. I've always had friends that were just enough smarter than me that I was like, damn, I'm never gonna be that smart. And so I always tried to find a different lane. And in the beginning it was being funny. And so for a long time, I wanted to be a stand-up comic, mm. but it was all self-deprecating because right. I had low self-esteem. Mm. I would just make fun of myself all day, which only reinforced my low self-esteem. For sure. And so while I was very funny, it didn't feel good. And so ultimately end up rejecting that. Um, but yeah, so at the height of my fluid intelligence, I did not feel intelligent. I felt the exact opposite. And you were getting tons of material success, thus helping you to understand later on as you, as you increased in wisdom, that the, if, if you take the instrumentality of money and make it your intrinsic focus, you're destined for misery. No doubt. Now, this is an interesting you know, insight that, that we, we can take back to ancient times. But St. Thomas Aquinas in 1265 writes his Summa Theologica, the seminal text of Western philosophy. You know, forget the, just the theology, just Western philosophy. And in it, he talks about this very interesting thing. He says that, that man, mankind, humankind, we'd say today, has four idols. You pursue, everybody pursues one or more of four idols. And he calls them the substitutes for God because his supposition Whoa. is that, that we all want God, but God is extremely inconvenient. A lot of one-sided conversations and a ton of rules. So we look Sounds for substitutes right. that have kind of these divine characteristics. The problem is they're 180 degrees off God. They're money, power, pleasure, and fame. Fame, he says, honor. 
which is has different connotations. The obvious son is a Marine who serves with honor. That's not what we mean. We're talking about admiration, envy uh, of other people of you, which is which is people want that, or or just prestige, or maybe fame. You know, some people actually want to be famous, but let's just call it money, power, pleasure, and fame. Everybody, you know, I play this game. What's my idol? And I'll ask people, not what's your actual idol, but what is not your idol? You know, of these four, money, power, pleasure, fame, what's the one that least attracts you, that you could get rid of with total impunity? Mm. You don't care. And then we'll, we'll start eliminating, and we're going to find your idol is the whole thing. Wow. Now, the interesting thing about that is that what he says is not that you'll go to hell if you do that. He says you'll be unhappy if you don't recognize the idol, if you don't recognize the idols in your life. The trouble is the limbic system of your brain, Mother Nature, that tyrant, tells you that you'll actually be happy if you get your idol. And so you chase it and you chase it. You can't quite figure out what you're going to do if you get it. Like you know, Tom's going to get you know, hundreds of millions or billions of dollars. What are you going to do with that money that you would actually like? And you can't quite figure out. Well, yeah, because if you, if you articulate it, you know, if I say you'll buy a yacht, and you're like, I don't, that sounds like kind of a hassle to have a yacht. Maybe it sounds good, but not that good, right? You, the, the real reason you want that is because you want admiration, because you want the, the validation of what it represents of you to you. You want a, this transference of social comparison you've always done with other people. You want to actually feel the thing that you felt for others about yourself. That's what the idols do. That's the nasty switcheroo. That's the, that's the despotism of, this, of, of, of mistaking the intrinsic good for the instrumentality. That's why Thomas Aquinas was so astute in what he was talking about here. So when we play this game, and we, we, we see what is actually holding us back. And you experience this. Absolutely, you were chasing the thing, chasing the thing, and chasing the thing, getting more and more and more miserable because you're actually getting closer and closer to your idol and realizing it will not realize one single thing that you needed for your own happiness. It had no intrinsic worth. Look, if there's anything about money, by the way, the research on money is very clear that... <clears throat> It doesn't actually ever bring happiness. It lowers unhappiness, which are processed in different hemispheres of the, of the brain. Happiness and unhappiness are not opposites. They're, not, they're different experiences. And what happens is at low levels, money will lower unhappiness. So when I could finally go to the dentist, I felt better. The trouble is I don't know how to do the sums inside my brain. I just knew I felt better. And we always mistake lower unhappiness for higher happiness. And so mm. early on, you're like, wow, I went from from you know, $15,000 to $20,000 a year, and I felt better. I actually felt better about myself. I was able to, to eliminate some of these sources of, of you know, misery, so I'm happier. And so you get into the pattern early on, you wire your brain when you're a young person working your way up the ladder, more money, feel better. That means more happiness. And you realize that going from $250,000 to $300,000 is not doing it, that because it's not big enough jump apparently, and so you go and you go and you go and you go and you go, and you're basically just chasing a lure. It's a real tyranny. What is up, my friends? I have huge news for you about one of the most exciting and important projects I've ever worked on in my life. As you guys know, it is my mission to help teach people about how to build a mindset and the skills that they're gonna need to live an extraordinary life. And over the last few months, I've been working hard behind the scenes to create a brand new tool that will help you do exactly that. It's called Project Kaizen, and I'm proud to announce that I'll be bringing it to the world later this year. Project Kaizen is a Web3 based game like experience that is a story based world that's going to allow you to get inside, build an avatar that is aspirational of who you want to become, and then take the path of the warrior seeking continuous improvement inside of a story world and game experience. All right, my friend, I cannot tell you how excited I am about this amazing new project, which I think ushers in a whole new form of entertainment. And I wanna meet you inside of Project Kaizen and help you have fun with these ideas of always getting better. All right, click the link and join me in Discord. And until then, my friends, be legendary. Take care, peace. No doubt. And that's what you experienced. And that's why you were miserable, right? Because you couldn't get there from here. It's interesting. Yes. I put different words to it, and I'm curious to see what you think about this. So I think about it from an evolutionary standpoint. So we have directives in our brain that there is going to be a sense of dis-ease if you don't do certain things. I think that deep and profound unhappiness can come from 
pursuing the wrong thing so that you're right. spending your time doing things that just they rob you of energy instead of giving you energy. But I also think that people end up profoundly unhappy by not doing things that nature wants them to do. Right. And I think one of the things that nature wants us to do, and so just not doing it will be a problem, is work really hard to turn your potential into skill set. Yeah. And so if things come easily to you, even though you're on top of the world and everybody else admires you and wants to be you, that there will be a sense of dis-ease for you right. because you're not working hard. It doesn't feel meritorious. Yeah. Nature has to find a proxy, right? Yeah, yeah. So nature wants you to have children, so it makes sure that sex is intensely pleasurable. But that's really just a proxy for have kids. Mm. So that I find really interesting, that, that nature is working in these weird proxies. So people end up like, you think you're supposed to do one thing, chase money, power, fame, whatever. And you're like, why does this suck? But all of those things actually do have utility. Mm. And so the thing with money is people are always going to pursue it. The thing with fame is people are always going to pursue it. Why? Because it actually has utility. So money, for instance, is more powerful than people think, not less, but it isn't what you've been told. Mm. So it's never what myself and everyone else included is trying to do is feel better about themselves. Right. It won't help with that. It right. cannot touch your self-esteem. And that's like the biggest like mind fuck ever. Your wife won't love you more. Your, your, wife won't your love children you more. won't respect you more when yeah. you have more money. Exactly. And more you, troubling. Yes. You won't respect you more. Yes. Which is ultimately the, because other people will. Like people treat me differently because I have some micro fame and, then, and because and I have it's money. actually troubling too. Because when you know somebody is instrumentalizing you, when you know somebody is objectifying you because of this outside characteristic, it makes you profoundly uncomfortable. It's interesting. People hate that. You know, it's the one thing where we will allow people to objectify us. You're well known. You're successful. And people will be nice to you because of that. And deep down, you know that they, 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 they don't love you. And it's not how it plays out in my head. How does it play out in your head? That I have no ability to be vulnerable around them. Oh, I see. For and sure. So but that's the same part of self objectification. That's the same part of objectification. Mm. You, and, ob and if when you're objectified, you can't be a full person. There's another interesting thing that might actually apply. You're a creative. You're fundamentally a creative. When you were doing your work, you were thrown off the creative process. Now, why is creativity intensely pleasurable? You get, you've read the work of Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, the, the great social psychologist who wrote a book, a very famous book called Flow, F-L-O-W, Flow. And what it talks about is how minutes, how hours turn to minutes of sheer pleasure mm. when you're in this flow state, when you're doing something that you can master. You're, you can, it's not too easy. It, it requires your ability, but you can master it because of your skill mm. and you can get into this groove. Creatives must create. If creatives are not creating, they will be miserable because they can't attain a flow state. It's very possible, Tom, that when you were in this part of your career, you needed to create. What you wanted to quit and go to Greece to do creation. You were basically craving that. It's like you had no protein in your diet for a year or something. And it's like, I don't know, I just can't stop thinking about peanut butter. Well, because <laughs> you, you, were, you, were, you were craving this macronutrient in your psyche. And, and you were never getting a flow state. And if you're denied the flow state that uniquely comes to you through creativity, you're going you're gonna to be practically suicidal. Yeah, it was, it was definitely a rough period. That's interesting. I've never thought about it as being intrinsically a reflection of the pleasurability of flow. But you might be right. It's just I feel, I feel alive. That is yeah. the right word. I feel alive when I'm creating. I yeah. am never happier than when I'm creating. It's amazing. People who are fundamentally creatives, look, same thing. You know, when I retired as a CEO and I came back to writing, speaking, and teaching, um, I'm a new man. I'm a new man for the past three years. It's extraordinary. You said something a while ago. I didn't want to interrupt you, but I want to go back to it now. You said you rediscovered yourself. Yeah. What does that mean? Like you need a sense of identity? Is that a core part of this? Like is when you say you rediscovered, is it a self narrative? It's you, you know who you deeply are as a person. You're acquainted with yourself. You're acquainted with your true self. And just as with people who are around you, you can, you can create a, an identity that's actually not authentic you can create an identity to yourself that's not authentic. You can be giving yourself a self narrative that's not true to actually who you are as a person. What does it mean who you are? What so you're good at, what you love? It generally speaking has to do with being in the zone of what you actually love to do and what you appreciate most. 
in your life, when you're in line with your own values, when you're living according to your own values. So Jung would have put it this way. Carl Jung, his definition of his understanding of happiness was that you need to understand your own values, what you value, what you think is proper and correct and moral. And if you know what that is and can articulate it and live according to that, you will be happy. Mm. If you, Do you agree with that? I think it's actually there's a lot of truth to that. Because you know you have to figure out what you think, what your model of the world actually is, what you think truth is, and then living in accord with your own values, with your own integrity, is is really critically important. Because when people live outside that groove, they're they're never in equilibrium. They're just never. The problem is that they're not comfortable. They're not comfortable in their own skin. And I've noticed this. You know, I was working. You know, it was it was it was, it was good being the president of a think tank. I was lucky to be president of a think tank. I believed in the work, but it, it wasn't who I was. And so I was kind of out of my groove for 10 years, 10 and a half years. And when I started going, when I went back to writing and speaking and teaching and doing creative work, I said, oh, it's weird. Is that weird. always who you were? Or was yeah. that because you switched into crystal? No, it's always who I was always a creative. You know, as a kid, I was painting and writing and composing music. And I just always wanted to be, I was, creativity is the most important thing in my life or mm -hmm. curiosity and creativity. Are the, are the most important thing that I can, not the most important thing in my life, the most important thing that I can do and when I'm actually happiest. And when I was managing a large workforce, managing a lot of creatives to their best selves, I mean, it was, they had certainly creative moments to it, to be sure, but it wasn't comfortable to me. And when I, my second curve, which was much more crystallized intelligence, is a lot, also a lot more creative. So I was kind of out of equilibrium for a long time during that period as well, which compounds the problem of my declining fluid intelligence, also not being in a creative role, but it's just so much better. I mean, I, I teach at a great university, which I love. I write for a magazine every week about things that I'm really interested in. I get to talk to you about it. This is, well, beats working. So true. For some reason, I was just thinking today, like I was pacing, listening to you, and I was like, I'm technically working right now. Weird. I was like, this is, Cool. Weird. It is super cool. And you know, there are people that I've met. It's interesting. You know, I talk to lawyers who don't feel like they're working. Oh. I talk to you know, a guy who's putting talk in cabinets in my house idea. and and he's super into putting in cabinets. Mm. He loves making cabinets. He was talking about all the details and he's so proud of his work. And I say, Do you do you do you like your work? And he said, It doesn't feel like work. You know, I went on a fishing expedition, deep sea fishing expedition with my son, Carlos. We, we, he loves to fish and we go fishing. And, uh, and the guy says, every morning I wake up and, and he says, today I'm going fishing. <laughs> <laughs> and so bad. this is what we all need to find. I mean, we need to, each person, because we have a, the blessing of living in an economy where you can do a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. Um, the problem is that people chase these extrinsic lures, the money, power, pleasure, and fame, and they get out of the groove of what they're supposed to do. And then they wonder why they're unhappy. I want to go.